we will talk about top decile SPAs in neurology. So in the past, I've given really difficult neurology single best answer question lectures, and loads of people have told me that they're too difficult. So I think for the smile one and for our YouTube channel, I tried to make it a bit easier and go through all the core stuff. But even then, some people were like, oh, can you please make it a bit harder? Can you give us some harder questions? Which I was really happy to do because um, neurology is really interesting. I really enjoy it. And there's lots of cool stuff to learn about. So um, I think the, the other, someone <laughs> suggested I use the title Top Decile Memes for High Achieving Neurology Teens, um, which then uh, let me think a bit more about if an SBA is actually a meme. And I suppose in a way it kind of is because I am transmitting this idea, behavior that I'm trying to tell you about um, or a style and it has sort of a significance um, and uh, it can be carried from person to person. So yes, SBAs are memes, I've decided. So um, yeah, not very useful, but interesting enough on my end. Cool. So there are going to be some difficult questions. Uh, some are difficult because they are quite complicated. Some of the stems are a bit long. Some are difficult because there may be conditions you haven't really heard about that much or aspects of conditions that you don't know so much. So I really want you to just relax. Don't worry about it too much. Just sort of release yourself from all your, um, all your worries and just use it as an opportunity for us to just um, think about neurology, learn a bit more, uh, practice your exam technique in terms of more difficult questions, um, and then use it as a springboard for further reading. So if you find something you never really heard about and you want to learn more about it, then uh, just write it down and uh, have a read about it. Um, and if you have an interest in neurology like I do, uh, perhaps it's a good opportunity for you to develop that interest. Um, and may, at the end, I've just got a slide about if you want to be a neurologist in the UK how to be a neurologist. Um, so I'm in internal medicine, we do three years, and then we go on to do neurology. And I'll tell you a bit more about that right at the end, if we have some time. Cool, so without further ado, uh, let us go through, this is what we're gonna talk about, inflammatory disorders, encephalitides, Parkinsonism, a bit more about the stuff we talked about in my previous lecture. So if any of this doesn't sort of make that much sense, or you're not really sure, and you wanna go through the core stuff, then go to our uh, tutorial group and um, just uh, answer, just have a look through the uh, initial lecture. So hopefully that these two lectures combined will come together quite nicely. Um, so in terms of how I think about neurology before we start off as a framework, um, I always try and think about what the signs are that I see in front of me. And that is true as well in single best answer questions. Um, so the, and a lot of it is actually trying to think where the lesion is. And this is really how neurologists think. So they think about sort of if it's a syndrome, as it were. So the where here on this side is Parkinsonism, peripheral neuropathy, cerebellar disease, spastic paraparesis. And they all have a different sort of pattern, as it were. And once you think about where the lesion is, then you start thinking about the what. And that sort of comes across in the same way as the surgical sieve some might use. So you think about vascular, you think about infective trauma, for example, as a cause. And in some instances, you can use this concept of having like top three differentials and uh, to use in your head and then uh, trying to figure out uh, what these three differentials are. But um, in a lot of cases, what you might do is just sort of uh, think about these differentials, talk about why the diagnosis is that way, and then you discuss investigations and management. So it's, it's a whole sort of process in neurology of thought and logic, which I quite like, and that's why I was drawn to neurology. But of course, it does require a lot of reading, a lot of interest. So um, with that in mind, going to this top three differentials, um, this is one of my slides from last lecture, just as a quick recap. So I use this as a, like a crib sheet to think about things in a bit more detail. So like, you know, if I see a question and I think, okay, what is this question showing me? I will sort of look through this in my head and think, okay, is this spastic paraparesis, which basically um, would be sort of um, both legs have upper motor neuron signs. And in my head, I'm thinking, it could be MS, cord compression or stroke as the initial causes, you know? And, and it really, it's really helpful for your SBAs, of course, but also it's really helpful in your OSCEs. So like if you're, um, you know, if you have someone who has both legs so that have upper motor neuron lesions and the examiner asks you what your diagnosis differential is, you can just say multiple sclerosis, cord compression and stroke. So, you know, it's like a helpful crib sheet that you can think about um, and then you can use it for lots of different scenarios. So this is one I developed actually as a final year medical student and it's sort of kept in my mind over the next, over the next few years afterwards. Um, so uh, first question, let's crack on and see what people think. So I'll give you about a minute or so to go through each question and then uh, we'll go from there. <laughs> 
right? So we'll give you another maybe 10 more seconds uh, to see what you think. So trying to do it in exam conditions. So usually most exams, you'll do it in about a minute and 10 seconds. So that's what we're aiming at. So try and put your last few uh, answers in, please, if that's all right. Okay, let's finish off there. See what people have said. Good. So 33% have gone for B, uh, and then uh, 24, 28 have gone for A and C. That's cool. So a reasonable spread. So that's good. So hopefully lots of learning points here. Um, so the answer is actually B. So let's look at the answer in a bit more detail. So you've got a lady who's come in with from the neurology clinic, and she's got weakness, which is better in the morning and then in the evening. Um, she has proximal limb weakness, so motor lesion, um, mild bilateral ptosis, exacerbated by prolonged upgaze, but reflexes and sensation are intact. So here we're thinking that there's a motor problem, which is fine, but also there's an eye problem. I think in the key thing here in this scenario is that we have uh, someone that's exacerbated by prolonged upgaze. So there's this element of what we would call fatigability. For your exams, it tends to be someone who has fatigability with motor weakness. The diagnosis is often myasthenia gravis, which is the answer here in this scenario. So with that in mind, we think about it. Let's look at the answers. So I mean, and you may think you may sort of be thinking that I'm using this cover uncover test, which is essentially thinking about things first in the stem and then reading the answers. So for example, A, repetitive nerve stimulation shows an increase in action potential with repeated stimulation. That's incorrect, incorrect because in my senior gravis, you should get weaker after lots of stimulation. So in this scenario, it would be a decrease in muscle action potential. The C is anti-voltage gated potassium calcium channel antibodies. That's not usually, um, uh, related to my senior gravis. So voltage-gated potassium channel antibodies can be related to, um, for example, encephalitis. And elevated creatine kinase, that can be true for certain myopathies. But in this scenario, the fact that it's exacerbated by prolonged upgaze um, at fatigability and also the evidence of ptosis makes it more likely to be my senior gravis. And finally, a toxin, uh, ELISA identifies toxin of Clostridium botulinum. Sometimes you can get motor weakness in Clostridium, but I think that's not uh, sort of that relevant in this scenario. So the, the reason why B is the answer is because that is one of the antibodies that is associated with the myasthenia gravis. So the most common, which you may have heard of, is um, anti, um, uh, what was it uh, on the next slide, sorry. Yeah, so acetylcholine receptor antibody, and that is the most likely. However, if that is negative, you may also go on to do muscle-specific tyrosine kinase antibodies. So if we talk a bit more about myasthenia gravis, um, it's an autoimmune disease that is related to antibodies developed to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors on the muscle fibers. So the key point here is that it is, affects the peripheral nerves and will lead to a lower motor neuron lesion. So you will have reduced, weak, you reduced reflexes, you will have uh, reduced power, uh, but you will not have any sensory loss. And it often comes about in the way of weakness of the limb muscles, um, ptosis, diplopia. So in this image, you can see that you have bilateral, uh, bilateral ptosis in, in, these, in this man because he is, his eyelids are um, lower down than you might expect. But also you might expect facial weakness. Um, one of the most dangerous re relationship, or relationships between myasthenia gravis and, and um, acute illness is the fact that you can get respiratory failure. And that's something you need to be very aware of in acute myasthenia gravis. Um, so fatigability is really the key. So if someone has fatigable muscle weakness, it tends to be myasthenia gravis. Um, so we talked a bit about the antibodies. So um, we do uh, serum acetylcholine receptor antibody and then tyrosine kinase if the first test is negative. Um, there's also this relationship between myasthenia gravis and uh, thymoma. And so you could do a CT chest to have a look at thymoma. Um, uh, so if there's any evidence of thymoma, uh, it tends to be related to a certain pattern of myasthenia gravis, which I'm not going to go through in more detail. Um, and there is some evidence that thymectomy, uh, removal of the thymoma, um, can be uh, beneficial for uh, myasthenia gravis, even in patients who don't actually have a thymoma. But again, that's sort of much more small print. I would not expect you to know that in medical school. What I would really want you to know is that you would manage with anti-cholinesterase inhibitors, such as pyridostigmine. You can give steroids, azathioprine. And then in the, in the acute setting, uh, you would, might give something like IVIG, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail later. 
But for your sake, what I would always suggest for you to know is to know that it's related to respiratory failure, particularly type 2 respiratory failure, secondary to um, muscle dysfunction, particularly around the diaphragm. And you need to make sure that you, you do, can do bedside spirometry, for example, and maybe check their arterial blood gas later on if they get really, really unwell, and a early referral to the intensive care unit if they become very unwell. And that tends to be what people remember in myasthenia gravis, especially in the acute setting. This is an old test on this right-hand side, a tensilon test, where you give an anti-cholinesterase, uh, sorry, acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, but rarely is done because of the risk of bradycardia. So the tests nowadays we use would be mainly the antibodies, to be honest. Sometimes we can do um, the nerve conduction, nerve stimulation tests and things, but generally antibodies um, we look at, um, but they also can be negative sometimes. Uh, so yeah, that's my senior gravis in a nutshell. Let's have a look at the next question. So 50 seconds, so another 15, 20 seconds. All right, so we'll wrap up, see what people think. Cool. Uh, so we have people, a good mix of C, D, and E, uh, 25, 26, and 30%. Uh, so fine so the answer here is uh e this condition is a trinucleotide repeat disorder so again don't worry if you're not getting this right this is all about learning and trying to discuss some key conditions that well, maybe you may come across in your exams may, whether they may be uh, oskis or your sbas and you have someone who has gradually worsening weakness in his hands so again we're thinking okay could this be motor for example um, could this be sensory? But really on the rest of the question, there isn't really much in the way of sensory. On physical examination, there's frontal balding. Um, and then the GP notes that the patient has difficulty letting go when he shakes his hand. So this is one example of the clues that are in the lecture that are in the single best answer that are there. And if you know it, you know it. If you don't, you don't. Um, unfortunately, it's one of those things. It's really about pattern recognition. In this particular scenario, what we're getting at is a condition called myotonic dystrophy. And that essentially is related to a, it's a genetic disorder um, that uh, can lead to loads and loads of different things, such as frontal balding, which you see, but also you get this myopathy where you um, have difficulty letting go when you shake your when, when someone shakes your hand. So you sort of shake someone's hand and you try and release, but they keep um, holding on to you. That's sort of myotonic dystrophy. And it's a dystrophy relating to the muscles, but it also has lots of different things relating to it. Um, looking at the answers here, A, um, it's not associated with type 1 diabetes. It's associated with type 2 diabetes. Um, the patient is not really likely to have cerebellar signs. Myotonic dystrophy is not associated with it. The condition is inherited in an autosomal recessive. Um, it's actually autosomal dominant. Um, and then diagnosis made by EMG and nerve conduction studies. They, a diagnosis is actually made by genetic analysis. Um, so it's not really made by, by EMG and nerve conduction studies. And it is true that it is a trinucleotide repeat disorder. So I'll talk a bit more about the condition in the next slide. So as I said, myotonic dystrophy is one of these spot diagnoses and it's something that can rarely come up in your exams, but just something to be aware about to be honest. So if you wanna do sort of postgraduate exams, it's good to have an idea basically of roughly what it is and basically you it's an expansion of an unstable trinucleotide repeat um, which you may have come across this term when you have someone for example as huntington's and this concept of anticipation which is a sort of a genetic phenomenon where you have worsening of your um symptoms with the same disorder 
in, uh, in future generations. So it just gets worse and worse. I'm not exactly sure of the genetic actually, how it works mechanistically, but it's certainly a phenomenon that is very well recognized in certain neurological disorders and others. Uh, it's autosomal dominant. Um, it tends to start off in adulthood. And as you can see here, you can really see quite a lot of things going on um, in the sense that um, there's just, it affects loads and loads of different things. So it causes frontal balding, it can cause cataracts, it is a cause of bilateral ptosis and facial weakness, and, but also in the sort of more general medical sense, which you may find useful, it can be related to cardiomyopathies, arrhythmias, so patients might have pacemakers, um, diabetes, um, and also testicular atrophy, peripheral neuropathy, and mild intellectual impairment. Um, so you can see that it's quite a lot going on, but like if you're in an OSCE, for example, in your undergraduate setting or the, or the postgraduate setting, you may see that they, are, they have baldness, um, they, you may see that they have bilateral ptosis, um, they have this grip myotonia when you shake their hand. So it's quite useful when you're examining someone in the neurological setting to just shake their hand first and just get a general idea of what they're normally like. So that's something I would add to your neurological examination when you're testing tone, which some of you will do, is just to shake someone's hand roughly just to see how their tone is generally. Um, and you could see someone who has a pacemaker, for example, or they have like uh, on, on the side of their, on the side of the bed, they could have something like, uh, I don't know, like sugar-free stuff, which is sort of uh, examiners are trying to point to you that it has diabetes basically. Um, so it's just sort of one extra thing that is useful for you to know about uh, if you come across this condition. So yeah, that's myotonic dystrophy. So just sort of something that if you know, you know, for future reference. And um, again, something that you, you probably won't expect to see that much in the undergraduate setting, but it's good to have an idea. Cool, let's have a look at the next question. So yeah, another maybe 15 seconds or so, or maybe 20 seconds is a slightly longer of a question. Right, so let's have a look at the answers, see what people think. Um, cool. So we have uh, C, 32%, D, 29%, and then I think E and E, 14 and 16%. Um, so a good spread. So that's good. So let's have a look at the answer. Um, the answer is B. Uh, so aquaporin 4 antibodies in the serum. So um, yeah, so I, again, really, I just this, this sort of question is just quite useful because um, you can sort of figure out... Um, how to go through questions in, in, in a logical, systematic fashion. It doesn't actually matter if you get the answer wrong. It's just sort of for understanding localization neurology. I think that's quite an important point. So you have someone with bilateral lower limb weakness, okay? Um, bilateral loss of vision and urinary incontinence. So normally with weakness and urinary incontinence, we're thinking of someone who has maybe a spinal lesion. And then bilateral loss of vision, okay, that's interesting. That's not really usually related to spinal conditions. Similar episodes which result after steroid administration so hmm, okay could this be inflammatory fine um, and then there is muscle power three bilaterally there's spasticity there's hyperreflexia upper motor neuron lesion oh there's also a sensory deficit before below t10 and there is uh, fundoscopy shows swollen optic discs so the swollen optic discs uh, is sort of indicative of this what we might call papilledema um, but um, so really we're thinking here is there someone who has a spinal lesion, but also eye lesions? And so in this particular scenario, the diagnosis is something called uh, neuromyelitis optica, which is similar to sort of 
it's an immune condition basically that in the past used to be thought to be on a spectrum with multiple sclerosis. And you can see why, because in a sense that you have similar episodes which resolved after steroid administration, it sounds a bit sort of like MS. Um, but equally there's some eye disorder. You can get swollen optic disc or you also you can get sort of pale optic discs and optic neuritis, but there is some optic neurology or neuropathy there. Um, most likely. And in someone who has neuromyelitis optica, um, the most uh, sort of defin definitive to a certain extent test is going to be the aquaporin 4 antibodies. So voltage gated potassium channel antibodies in the serum, that's more likely to be due to um, so certain forms of encephalitides or encephalitis, uh, autoimmune ones, which we'll talk about later. NMDA receptor antibodies, same also sort of more encephalitis spinal ring enhancing lesion normally when we talk about ring enhancing lesions that tends to be more related to things like um like tuberculosis or like or abscesses or things like that so but it can be inflammatory in some instances but in this case sort of it's not the sort of infit not as consistent with the likely diagnosis and finally mri reveals multiple vertebral lytic lesions that could be a spinal disorder like if you have cancer for some reason um, and then it's going into your spine but again Patient's slightly younger, it's got relapsing disease and no previous history of cancer and the eye disease, it doesn't really make sense. So that's why um, aquaporin-4 antibodies is the correct answer. So if you want to learn more about neuromyelitis optica, this is a bit more about it. So this is Devic, also called Devix disease. And basically you get this link of between optic neuritis and also transverse myelitis. So you can see here in this image on this right-hand side, taken from a very good journal called Practical Neurology, you have this longitudinally extensive lesion. So essentially there's this big lesion that sort of longitudinally extends and it's within the spine. That tends to be more uh, associated with NMO, so neuromyelitis optica. Um, it is associated with these antibodies, so out targeting aquaporin-4. It can be relapsing uh, remitting. And it is a separate disease entity to multiple sclerosis, even though it does sort of look a bit the same. And it essentially leads to demyelinating lesions everywhere. And it can lead to loads of different, um, it, can, it can have sort of different presentations, but on the most part, you tend to get this transverse myelitis in the spine and also an optic neuritis. If you have a relapse, you can treat it with steroids. And one of the treatments for it is plasma exchange, um, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail in a second. Uh, so that's neuromyelitis optica. Um, so just with regards to this concept of plasma exchange and IVIG, th these are some really sort of specialist niche treatments you would give in neurology. And I'm just putting this up just for general interest, if you are interested. Um, both of these are like immuno, what we call them as sort of immunomodulatory treatments. And plasma exchange, you're taking out harmful antibodies from the plasma, and you can use it for GBS or Guillain-Barre. CIDP is cr chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, myasthenia gravis, NMO, lots of different stuff basically, but I don't know really which ones. And equally, IVIG is essentially when you give someone loads of antibodies. The mechanism isn't very clear, but it, it's thought to be some way of like trying to dampen down the immune system by giving someone different antibodies. That's roughly how it works. And it's used also for loads of inflammatory disease. Um, so these ones are sort of very specialist, usually given in the neurology ward. I put them on just for general interest. Side effects wise, usually not so much. There is a increased risk of thrombosis sometimes, anaphylaxis as well, rare, but you can get sort of weird feelings, have some chest pain, shortness of breath, fatigue, those sort of things. But on the whole, generally quite safe, but you need to sort of monitor people um, just to make sure that they're fine on this treatment. So just as a general understanding of how these treatments work, but you will not be expected to know the ins and outs of it. It's just as a, just so you know. Cool, um, fine, so let's go through the next question.
right? So give me another uh, 10 more seconds to go. Um, right, I'll have a look at the polls. Yeah, thank you very much. Cool, so let's see what people think. Okay, so I think, cool. So most people have gone for B, which is very, very good. So that is the correct answer. So 78% have gone for B. Um, it's correct, so well done. Uh, so this is a question just about sort of um, like the clues in, in oh, sorry, uh, in someone who has um, this sort of bilateral lower limb hypertonia, ankle clonus, pyramidal weakness. So basically they've got upper motor neuron lesion in both, um, in both, legs, which can be quite difficult to diagnose sometimes because you get these spinal lesions that no one really knows about. So, and, and in terms of why they're having this, this strange new uh, lower limb weakness. And the other thing that's helpful is the MRI is normal. So that sort of helps out in terms of diagnosis. So 40 year old man with lower limb hypertonia, um, less likely to be multiple sclerosis, I suppose, because you can still get it in 40 year old men, but maybe sort of younger women is the classical sort of uh, MS uh, presentation. Also, you may expect stuff on the whole spine MRI to find some evidence of demyelination, so less likely. Metastatic prostate cancer, MRI is normal, so you can't, you can't really see any sort of cord compression, which you might expect. Um, discitis, less likely because, you know, he doesn't have any risk factors, like being immunosuppressed, for example, or, you know, he it says he's previously fit and well, so you're going to assume that he doesn't actually have any other risk factors from this question itself. So again, less likely. Also, the MRI is normal. Ischemic stroke is not likely because you wouldn't really expect both limbs to be weak. Ischemic stroke is more likely to affect one side of the stroke, one side of the, um, one side of the, um, uh, the le uh, one, one leg rather, or one side of the brain. So therefore one side of the, uh, the, the leg. So really by exclusion, you have this um, hereditary spastic paraphrasis. Um, uh, and actually, sorry, I should read, his father had a similar presentation in the past or something like that. So really the idea here is that you have this something that is hereditary. So in this particular scenario, the most likely diagnosis is hereditary spastic paraphrasis, which is a rare cause of um, bilateral lower limb weakness and it tends to be hereditary. It's a genetic thing. I don't think you need to know much more about it. But for this scenario, I use it as a way of bringing out this sort of spinal lesion discussion as it were. Um, so looking at the clues of spinal disorders and you know it's useful in, in the exam world to have a good idea of how things go so neuromyelitis optica spinal lesion and optic neuritis and um, spinal infarct is more like stroke so it's hyperacute they may have vascular risk factors very very quick discitis and um, if you have someone who is an intravenous drug user immunosuppressed has a fever more likely, um, and also cord compression, back pain, uh, red flag features like weight loss and uh, any sort of cancer features in the past, and then this HSP, hereditary spastic paraphrasis, is hereditary. So this more sort of goes into the bit about the what. So once you've figured out that it is a spinal lesion, then you start looking for clues basically about what the cause is, and that's the sort of way to think about uh, making a diagnosis in neurology. So that's sort of a really sort of helpful way of thinking about it. So hopefully that's useful. Um, cool, let's have a look at the next question. Right, so let's see what people think. Uh, so, last few seconds. Good. So we have 72% have gone for C, and then 
well, we've got 25, 15% uh, have gone for A as well. Good. So you sort of figured out the, 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 the thrust of the question, as it were. So basically, the, with, this is about anatomical localization in neurology. So it's a quite a useful way of trying to figure out where the lesion is. And um, it's these two things that we tend to distinguish between in someone who has foot drop. So someone who's got high stepping gait, that tends to indicate that they have a, a drop of the foot because they have weakness of dorsiflexion or plantar flexion, or, but mainly sort of dorsiflexion, sort of you can't really lift your leg up and therefore it's sort of high stepage gait. So when you're walking, it sort of flops on the floor uh, when you're walking. Um, the key sort of scenario here is that it's telling you that they, she can't dorsiflex or avert her right ankle. Um, and that is sort of the indication that um, someone may or may not have common fibular uh, perineal nerve palsy or L5 root lesions. I want to talk a bit more about the anatomy, but in terms of the other stuff, just so we can go through, um, Cotaquina syndrome, less likely because you may have some back pain, you may have some urinary frequency problems, and also you may have a history of cancer. Guillain-Barre syndrome is less likely because it's sort of um, been going on for so long, about six months. Inclusion body myositis, less likely as it's more of a muscular thing rather than a nerve thing. Um, and then, yeah, that leaves us between L5 root lesion and then perineal nerve palsy. So let's talk about that in a bit more detail with some images because that will be more helpful. So this is how I think about inversion, eversion. This is some, it's a, sometimes the stupidest things, the way, the way to remember things, quite, they look quite stupid, but actually it just helps me to remember things. So I always used to get mixed up between what inversion, eversion was. So like, if you think about your feet like that, inversion is like that. And I remember it by space invaders, they land on a hill because your feet sort of look like that. So that's sort of a hill. And whereas eversion is like that. So if you have your feet like that, you do that. And I always thought that it was like how tax evaders would go into the valley. I couldn't really find a good image for tax evaders because I didn't look, really know what they looked like. So I just put a man in a suit. But yeah, basically I thought tax evaders would want to go into the valley. So basically that's inversion and that's eversion. That's how I remembered it. And I thought it was a easier way of remembering as a student. And I actually still use it in my head today. I'm just like, oh, okay, is it like this or is it like that? So hopefully that's useful. But if not, you have your own way. That's absolutely fine. Um, so uh, these are the sort of the dermatomes of uh, the knee, uh, the, the leg, and also a bit about the common perineal nerve. So just this is the common perineal nerve. So you can see it's more on the like lateral side of things going out. Um, so uh, the common sort of common perineal nerve palsy is someone who like does yoga and is uh, perhaps sitting cross-legged and they may sort of push on the lateral side of their foot, or their leg rather, and that will affect the common perineal nerve. Um, and equally, just for the dermatomes of the lower limb, uh, just for revision's sake, L3 is at the knee, that's how I remember it, and then L4, L5, and S1, um, sort of as, a, as you're going towards the back. Um, dermatomes, not so useful in this question, but the more important thing here is this common perineal nerve, which is on the lateral side, okay? So with the sort of lateral think side thinking, you'd expect that uh, you will have a problem with eversion, because if you have a problem with the common perineal nerve, uh, you are you can't really lift this up in that direction. So just that's the thought process uh, I have in mind. So foot drop is a uh, it's commonly tested because it's a useful way of neurologists to sort of uh, test your localization, and it can either be a common perineal nerve or L5 radiculopathy commonly in the sort of exam scenario. And the key is that you have eversion, which is weak in both. So both of them you find it difficult to evert. But L5 sort of has an effect on inversion as well. So you can't really invert it. Whereas as you might expect in the common perineal nerve, you, there's really no effect on inversion. It's more, more eversion. And that's sort of the difference is it's a bit difficult to sort of memorize. So perhaps you may want to use some flashcards to remind yourself. Um, but generally speaking, that is how you think about things. And then you may consider an MRI or nerve conduction studies. Um, but really, in a lot of cases, you just do both um, just to make sure that you're not missing anything but it just remains a very useful learning point for neurological localization. Um, this is a very difficult question. And again, I was telling you that we're trying to go through some more difficult stuff, but try and take the sort of fundamental principles of localization, thinking about things and trying to sort of get a better understanding of neurology in general. So I don't worry too much about the, the, the little details. Try and take the principles as a whole if you're not there yet in your training. Cool. So let's look at the next question.
So I'll give you another 15 more seconds just to have a think about things. Okay, cool. So see what people think. So another five seconds or so. Um, then we'll look at the polls. Cool. So excellent. Good. So some people have gone for, uh, so most people have gone for E, 63%, and then some people have gone for B. So I think lots of you have uh, uh, not gone for my trap, which is very, very good. Um, and then, so basically, I wanted to talk about, which was in my previous lecture, I talked about Parkinson's disease, and some people wanted to know more about Parkinson's plus syndromes, which I'm happy to go through in a bit more detail. Um, and basically, there's this idea that you have Parkinsonism, which is this triad of having this resting tremor, but also, uh, sorry, it's, it can be related to a resting tremor, postural instability, bradykinesia, um, and then also there are more rare causes are called Parkinson's plus syndromes. And in this particular scenario, um, what I wanted to go and teach you about was the fact that in Parkinson's disease, you can have a lot of um, um, non-motor uh, issues, which is the case here. So I think a lot of people may have gone for multisystem atrophy because there is some orthostatic hypotension, which is very common in multisystem atrophy. But generally speaking, what the most likely diagnosis still is Parkinson's disease. And the reason for that is because it's more prevalent, Parkinson's disease, but also, you can have a orthostatic hypotension in Parkinson's. Um, so let's talk about Parkinson's plus in a bit more details. I'm sure everyone wants to know a bit more about it. Um, but generally speaking, common things are very common. So if it looks like Parkinson's disease, it's probably more likely to be Parkinson's disease. So tremors, rigidity, bradykinesia, postural instability, which we talked about in the previous lecture, um, Parkinson's disease, also called idiopathic Parkinson's disease, can also be vascular, drugs, and then Parkinson's plus, which I'll talk about. And Parkinson's tends to be asymmetrical in the sense that you will have a tremor perhaps on your, you know, only on the right hand, for example, or the left hand, rather than both. If it's symmetrical in both hands, it's more likely to be something else, basically. And that tends to be something like vascular or maybe like drugs, such as antipsychotic drugs. Um, do not forget the non-motor features of Parkinson's because they can be equally disruptive to people's quality of life in comparison to motor disorders as well. So you can have issues with smell, uh, dementia, depression, um, this concept of REM sleep disorder where you act out your vivid dreams, orthostatic hypotension as I presented in my audit as a FY1 doctor a few years ago. Very pleased with that. Lots of people come in with falls. They come into general medicine, uh, they have Parkinson's, and then you do their lying and standing blood pressure, and then they have orthostatic hypotension, and that's probably why they fell. But probably there's a lot of reasons why they would have fallen. Um, so restlessness as well, constipation, urinary urgency, it's sort of bordering on like uh, elderly care stuff as well, which you commonly have. And you have these impulsive control disorders. And that's usually secondary to dopamine agonists because you're activating other pathways. So, you know, I remember reading about uh, a patient in hospital where he was an accountant or something like that. And he was started on dopamine agonists and then he just started ruining loads of people's affairs and stuff. And then the question was, was it because of his dopamine agonist or was it because of him? Or it was very, very difficult. So this was an interesting side of how neurology can uh, creep up into, to, into life uh, and your other affairs. So I thought that was very interesting. Uh, but yeah, known motor features, very, very important. So Parkinson's plus syndromes uh, after uh, the requests from others. So there's a few syndromes. Um, that I'm just going to talk about sort of the first three. The fourth one, Honestly, it's a bit of a myth to me, uh, cortico-basal basal, basal, or cortico-basal degeneration. Loads of stuff happens with it. Parkinsonism, apraxia, aphasia, cognitive defect. Really, I wouldn't worry about it. I'm just going to talk about the other ones in a bit more detail. So dementia with Lewy bodies, it, it can be uh, relating to an spectrum with Parkinson's disease, but it tends to be the dementia comes first. Um, multiple system atrophy, it can be symmetrical. It can be related to autonomic dysfunction. Um, but also you get this um, cerebellar dysfunction as well and some early bulbar dysfunction. Um, the other thing is progressive supranuclear palsy where you have early gait instability, lots of falls early on, 
and also vertical gaze paresis. So you sort of can't look up or down very well. And that tends to be related to something wrong with the eyes in itself, um, but also can be related to your neck extension, finding it difficult to move. But generally speaking, these conditions don't tend to respond very well to first line treatments in Parkinson's like dopamine, um, like L-DOPA. So that would increase your risk of suspicion um, if you are see these indiv individuals like that. Um, the diagnosis is mainly made by history and examination. Sometimes you can do this dopamine scan in special settings, but it's not so helpful in distinguishing between them. I'm not going to talk about it in more detail because it's super niche. Um, and then uh, just for a sort of factual uh, setting, uh, just factual sort of contrast, um, PD, DLB, and MSA are alpha-synuclein, um, whereas PSP and also corticobasal degeneration are tau protein. And then in contrast, Alzheimer's disease is beta amyloid. So I'll just say that for reference. And there's no real disease modifying therapies for all these treatments. A lot of it is supportive. Um, and uh, the, yeah, so that's just a, just a general view. But generally speaking, probably the diagnosis is going to be Parkinson's disease. It's kind of some atypical stuff. But really, like if things aren't working out and they're very early on, they have weird features, extra stuff, then you start thinking about the Parkinson's plus stuff. Um, cool. So that's a bit more detail. All right, let's have a look at this next question. Right, so um, you know, ten more seconds. See what people think. It's a very confident chat going on. Uh, so let's see what people think from the polls, which are there. Cool. Uh, so people gone for E. Most people. So forty-six percent. Is that right? Yeah, forty-six percent gone for B. So E, and then you've got a lot of other stuff. Fourteen, seventeen percent, seventeen percent on the other stuff. So. Answer is ipsilateral hyperreflexia. That is the most likely answer. So I think some people were talking about it in the chat, um, and I'm um, having a quick look. Uh, this is uh, hemisexual of a cord, which is also called uh, Brown Saccard syndrome, syndrome, that syndrome, which some of you have come across. Uh, it was initially um, many years ago found secondary to trauma to a side of the spinal cord, and at least a very sort of specific. Uh, spinal cord syndrome and therefore it comes up in exams because it's a very like uh, particular uh, anatomical localization. I'm not going to talk about the other stuff because it can get quite confusing without the diagram. So here's this diagram. So basically the idea is that you have some uh, lesion into the side of the cord for example and if we look at one that's essentially where the lesion is. So let's say someone stabs you there on that side. You will have loss of all your sensation, all your vibration sense, position sense and paralysis at that level because you literally are just affecting the spinal cord in that way. But the idea really is that you have certain spinal tracts that are either ipsilateral or contralateral. So you might remember that um, the corticospinal tract actually decussates quite high up at the level of the medulla. So therefore, you if so it decussates there and goes down. So if you have something that affects it there, you will have ipsilateral hyperreflexia and therefore sort of motor weakness. But also equally, the dorsal columns will go up as well. And therefore, the, um, the dorsal columns will go up there as well. And then if you have a lesion there, it will affect it ipsilaterally. However, the spinothalamic tract, as you might know or you might remember, it crosses after it enters the spinal cord. So basically, the idea is that because it crosses as soon as it enters, you will have contralateral pain and temperature loss. So that's Brown-Saccard syndrome. 
I have seen it once in my life uh, in a patient who had a neuromyelitis optica that had a um, lesion in one side of her spine and she actually had a brown saccard syndrome and loads of uh, medical students were just so keen seeing it because it's so rare and you know never seen it before but I think this concept of sort of having it in a secondary to trauma or stabbing or something um, is very very rare um, so I'm, I'm not sure if we would see it that much anymore maybe if someone had like a knife or a sword or something possibly but certainly in the neurological setting not very common but examinable enough so a bit to review it later on cool next question Right, so last maybe 15 seconds or so. Right, so, okay, very interesting. So, 66% so, so have gone for A um, and 21% have gone for B. So let's have a look. So the answer is actually migraine. And I think this is sort of one of those things where I think these are the hard, this is one of the hardest questions, I think, because it does come up certainly in finals um, to a certain extent where there are loads of different questions. So there are loads of choices that sort of make sense. So here what I've tried to do, this is a patient I actually saw in clinic with one of my consultants. And basically this patient had features of almost everything. And I was just in my head, I was thinking, oh, wow, you know, what, what could this be? You know, this is so many things. He's got, you know, what is he? Three month history of pain in his head, pain in the temple. Oh, that's really weird. Like, why would he have pain in his temple? And he's the, it gets worse when he touches his temple and he's some mild pain on palpation and there's a strong temporal pulse. Um, and I guess it's a, and these are the hardest questions because they ask you to weigh things, even though it could also be all of them. And which of the following is the most likely diagnosis is the answer here. So the reason it's not giant cell arthritis is because he's 55. He's a bit young for giant cell arthritis. You'd expect people to be slightly older. So maybe sort of in the over 60s, 70s, 80s tend to be the sort of main subset of people. I, I, I put that he has some pain in his neck and upper back during work. Um, that's sort of a distractor in a sense. Some people might think of sort of PMR, but actually, you know, lots of people just get neck pain sometimes. So that's sort of a bit of a distractor as well. He's got mild palpation or palp pain on palpation of his temple. And there's a strong temporal pulse. So in giant cell arthritis, you may have absence of the temporal pulse because there's an occlusion. So that's why it's less likely to be giant cell arthritis. Trigeminal neuralgia is less likely in the sense that yeah, it gets worse when he touches his temple during his episodes, but there's usually the trigger in trigeminal neuralgia is you have this, is you touch it and then it gets worse. And yes, he has some mild pain on palpation of his temple, but actually it should be very, very painful, trigeminal neuralgia. Equally, in tension headache, that is more likely to be a band-like pain um, and sort of related to stress, but in this case, it isn't that much stress. And cluster headache, you'd have these clustered episodes and also uh, the... Um, you would may have some red eye or, or lacrimation, uh, which is sort of uh, when your eye le leaves lots of fluid coming out. Um, and that is less likely in this scenario. So really from exclusion, we think that it's more likely to be a migraine because it sort of matches. You know, there are some features of migraine here that make sense. You know, he's got pain in his temple, which is sort of part of the head, isn't it? It's a unilateral headache that comes and goes. Um, and then he has nausea. Nausea and vomiting also can come together as part of migraine. Um, and as an exclusion, it does make sense. Migraine is the most likely diagnosis here 
after discussing all these things together? This is a very, very hard question. I wanted to make it as a point so that you have to sort of sometimes weigh between different things. And the more you progress in your medical degree, the more likely you be asked to sort of weigh between different things that are equally likely in a, to a certain extent. So, so he essentially in this temple, he, although he was pointing towards pain in his temple, actually the pain is sort of there. So this sort of unilateral throbbing sort of headache where you can get visual or sensory aura or nausea, photophobia, phonophobia. But it is very difficult sometimes to distinguish between them. So I think in our scenario, it was more of an exclusionary diagnosis. And that's what make it, it made it so hard. But that's why when you're answering questions, I really want you to think about along the lines of, is it this or is it that? Which one is it? Um, and um, with... Acute migraine, you treat with a triptan, uh, you can treat with NSAIDs or paracetamol, um, and then prophylactically, if they have loads of recurrent episodes, you can have uh, propanolol, um, amitriptyline, topiramate as well, and then in some people, they just have loads of uh, painkillers, and they can have this medication overuse headache, uh, which can also make their headache worse. And then someone who has migraine, you would want to avoid the oral contraceptive pill because there is a uh, proposed uh, risk of stroke, which is a thing. So uh, you would, especially someone with aura as well. So there's a relationship between migraine with aura and stroke in the oral contraceptive pill. So you would be wary of that. Cool. So I understand that loads of people are very probably upset or angry in the in the chat, and you may have really not really considered it, but use it as a learning experience to distinguish between different things and consider why it's something or why it's not the other thing based on your own understanding of the condition itself. So there will be lots of clues normally in this sort of scenario. Cool, so I'll look at the next question. Right, so another 10 more seconds, guys, so we can uh, have a look um, at what people think. I think there's maybe like three or four questions left, if that's all right, so we'll try and wrap up. Um, really hard questions, so well done for everyone who's uh, pushing through. Uh, I know it's difficult, but uh, just to, to help you learn, I think, to, to think about neurology in a bit more detail. Uh, fine, so let's see what the polls show. Uh, so let's see. Um, Cool. So, right. Uh, so people have gone for D and also gone for E. Um, cool. So this is the two learning points here in this question. One is I want you to understand stuff about localization. That's number one. And then number two is um, I want you to just be aware of this particular condition, which is not that important, but it's just something that uh, you're, you're aware of. Um, but it's not as important as the localization, to be honest. The answer is Friedrich's ataxia. Uh, again, loads of people didn't really consider and that's fine. Absolutely, absolutely fine. Um, but more important is the localization. So this is neurology. Sometimes, you know, this is a patient who's actually a 14 year old boy, so he's young. So could be stretching on pediatrics, but we learn. Um, we, there is wasting of the lower limb muscles. There is, that is a lower motor neuron sign. There is spastic hypertonia. That is upper motor neuron sign. Reduced power can be both. Absent knee and ankle reflexes is lower motor neuron, and then upgoing planters is upper motor neuron. So this is a patient who has mixed upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron signs. There's also a pes cavus and kyphoscoliosis, which is uh, when you have some uh, um, abnormality in your spine uh, or when you have scoliosis in the spine. And a pes cavus is when you have this sort of abnormal flexion in your foot that sort of looks like that. Uh, and then that is um, also related to Friedrich's ataxia. Um, 
multiple sclerosis is not possible because they only have upper motor neuron signs. Um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is more of a muscular disease, so you wouldn't really expect mixed upper and lower motor neuron signs. charcot marie tooth syndrome is a peripheral neuropathy, and so only lower motor neuron. Syphilis can cause a mix of upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron. Um, however, in this scenario, you wouldn't expect it to be the case because you have lots of other stuff that's related to Friedrich's ataxia, and also younger person, you wouldn't expect them to have syphilis in that scenario. Usually that would be someone who's a bit older, you know, who may have sort of tertiary syphilis. Um, so Friedrich's ataxia, it's uh, osomal dominance, progressive neurodegenerative movement disorder. Essentially, all that's in this scenario points towards it. You get this mixed upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron, you can get also cerebellar signs, you can get kyphoscoliosis, pes cavus. Um, but I'm not going to focus about that too much. I just want to talk about upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron signs as a method of um, localization, because that's more useful. Um, so this is a mnemonic that my friend made at medical school, which I really like, and I, I literally use it in my head quite a lot. And this is anyone who has mixed upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron is Fred's tabby cat seeks mice. Um, and basically, um, Friedrich's ataxia, uh, tabus dorsalis, cervical spondylosis, when you have a cervical lesion um, or a, a bone pushing on bits of the upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron sides, Subacute degeneration of the cord can affect both and also motor neuron disease. So in your head, when you're thinking about someone who has mixed upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron, these are the sort of conditions to think about. Um, I think lots of people get really bogged down with the mechanisms in neurology and ask, okay, why does Friedrich's ataxia have this? Why does it have that? And to be honest, a lot of these are just syndromes that just so happen to come together. And I'm not sure there's a very good mechanistic explanation. So sorry, I'm not gonna be able to answer that, but I'm trying to sort of point you more towards localizing in a bit more detail. So hopefully that has helped. Uh, and this is, uh, yeah, this is what I've used and I still use it today when I think about it. And I think in an older individual in their 60s, maybe the 50s, man, maybe motor neuron disease is probably the most likely you would be worried about as well. Okay, so uh, last, I think, maybe two or three questions, I think. Uh, we'll give you some time to go through. at the previous poll, sorry, not sure. Um, is this the poll? I'm not sure. Is that the right earlier poll, perhaps? Uh, Fine. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. Thanks. Thanks a lot, John. So yeah, hard questions. Um, don't worry. Learning. And you can review stuff later and then just use it as a way of sort of thinking about things going forward. Right. So uh, maybe a last sort of 10 seconds or so, put in your answers. Okay, so let's see what the answers are, what people think so far. Um, cool, so I think, okay, 36% have gone for A, 28 have gone for D, and then 19% have gone for B. So that's cool, that's cool. It's got a good spread. So the answer is actually A, uh, NMDR receptor antibodies. Um, so, um, so you have someone who is 45 years old, with memory loss, which is weird. You know, you wouldn't really expect someone to have memory loss at 45 years old, even if it's like a dementia as well. Over four months as well, like even if it was dementia, you'd expect it to be a bit more long standing. Um, difficulty in remembering stuff varies from day to day, possibly fluctuating. Um, quite paranoid, again, weird, okay. Memory loss, paranoia, okay. Episode of facial twitching, very weird. Okay, why does he have facial twitching? Um, and then your neurological examination is actually normal, but you notice that her AMTS is 7 out of 10. So she is confused. So really in this scenario, we need to be thinking about some actually very serious neurological pathology. Um, and the most likely diagnosis is some sort of encephalitis. Um, and in 
you, in the most common cause of encephalitis is probably something that's more likely to be viral. Um, in this particular scenario, like and, and things like uh, herpes simplex or varicella zoster, for example, but in his scenario, you can't really see anything that points you towards it. Uh, and actually, none of the answers are telling you about viral encephalitis. So, um, oligoclonal bands, that's more MS. MS doesn't really have this sort of feature with worsening memory loss on its own without anything else like a relapse. Brain biopsy, um, it's most not really that likely to reveal the diagnosis, especially without anything else. Um, it's sort of a bit of a last ditch attempt. I suppose it could, but it probably um, depends on where you're biopsying. You don't know where you're going to biopsy. PET CT is useful in autoimmune encephalitis um, in the sense that uh, it can help you to find out any underlying um, cancer, um, but it's not the most likely to reveal the diagnosis if it is the case. And the E is relating to lupus, which could be the cause of this sort of um, if you've got cerebral lupus, I suppose, but again, not likely, more likely possibly to be a bit more localized. So really the most likely answer is something like an autoimmune encephalitis of which NMDR receptor antibodies is one of them. So that's sort of how you would get to that uh, towards the end. So with that in mind, we'll talk about encephalitis in a bit more detail. And in general, encephalitis is an, uh, something that is affecting the whole brain. So it's an itis of the encephal, in, 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 what is it, the so encephalo is brain, itis is inflammation, so inflammation of the brain, basically. Um, so features, altered mental status, fever, flu-like illness, seizures as well. Viral, we talked about, HSV, VSV. Bacterial meningitis can be common encephalitis, and you usually do things like a CT head, MRI, lumbar puncture, if there's no signs of any focal neurology. And then you can see temporal lobe changes in a multifocal hemorrhage, and you would treat with acyclovir, and you might treat for the anticonvulsants. So... We're talking advanced stuff. That's why the sort of this lecture talks about advanced stuff. Um, so we'll just talk about autoimmune encephalitis. It's super rare. It's very academic stuff, but you know it's good to know. It's good to have an idea of what sort of things we talk about in autoimmune encephalitis. Also for more interest as well. So autoimmune encephalitis. It's a weird thing in the sense that you know loads of people which we who we thought perhaps were just sort of psychotic, were young, didn't really take any drugs or anything. And, uh, you know, increasingly recognized as the cause of psychosis in younger people. So you have such a wide variety of symptoms. So confusion, seizures, movement disorders, you know, um, low GCS, for example. And the symptoms can fluctuate. There are certain antibodies that are related to the uh, receptors. Um, so essentially antibodies against different receptors. So NMDA receptors, voltage-gated potassium channels, um, receptors of which they can be broken down to LGI-1 and Casper-2 and to Hue as well, just, just for reference. Um, investigations, sometimes you have a low sodium, uh, which can be a clue in LGI-1 encephalitis. You could do an MRI head and that could sort of lead to some, you can see perhaps some white matter changes. EEG, if someone is having seizures, for example, that could help. And the other thing about autoimmune encephalitis is in some instances, it can be related to cancers. So it could be what is called a paraneoplastic syndrome, which can be in NMDR classically with an ovarian teratoma, um, anti-HU with small cell lung cancer. So this sort of, uh, so it's good to do stuff like a CT head, uh, sorry, a PET CT, which can look all around the body for any evidence of any cancers, which is useful if you're worried about someone who has this condition, which is quite rare in itself. And it's an autoimmune disease. So we treat with steroids, IVIG, um, if required. And it's a very specialist thing. So for example, in the UK, a lot of our antibodies get sent to Oxford because they have an autoimmune encephalitis sort of research center. They're the ones that actually developed the uh, antibodies um, or sort of the antibody tests for them. So they do it there. So it takes ages to come back. So you have to sort of think about in terms of, is it more likely to be an autoimmune encephalitis? Um, because it does take so long for the, the results to come back. Um, I think this is our last question, I think, uh, as far as I remember. So we'll have a look. Then we'll take questions afterwards.
So another uh, 10 more seconds, guys, just to put all your answers in. I think this is the last question, and we'll wrap up with uh, loads more uh, answers. Uh, sorry, with uh, more question, answers to your questions. And then, uh, yeah, this will be recorded, so you can have a look at it later. Um, so hopefully that's useful. So we'll have a look at the answers. So we'll see what people think. And then, cool. Oops. So looking at the poll, is the poll working? Not sure. Maybe. Can anyone, everyone see the poll? Mm. Okay, fine. Oh, there we go. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, fine, 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 fine. So the answer in this particular scenario is, so what, what do people say? So 57% is C. Then 20% B, 9% E, and then 6% A. So the answer is actually low molecular weight heparin. Cool. So this is again is one of these scenarios where you really have to be very confident about your diagnosis because and you have to know what the imaging findings show and 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 also but there's lots of clues here that might point you towards the the diagnosis. So postpartum. Anyone who's postpartum in exams tends to be at higher risk of thrombosis. That's the sort of general thought process in the medical world. Um, headache, not resolving, horizontal diplopia on lateral gaze. So there's some neurological findings in the eyes. Small left-sided cortical hemorrhage and a hyperdense superior sagittal sinus. So which of the following is the next best step in the management of this patient? So the hyperdense superior sagittal sinus is essentially diagnostic for a um, venous sinus thrombosis, which is a common um, it's not common, but it is a sort of, it is what you would expect in someone who maybe might be at high risk. So someone is postpartum, but because of you essentially get a clogging up of the veins in the, in the, the sagittal sinus, you can get this hemorrhage in the, the rest of the brain because it sort of is a backlog. So the fluid is sort of blood is going out. That's why you get a hemorrhage. And it's a really tricky one because the, the, the next best step in the management of the patient is actually to give them heparin, which is insane because in thinking about it, like, uh, in the sense that it's the same because you're, you're giving someone who's got a hemorrhage, you give them more blood thinners, but actually it is the treatment to try and break down the clot and therefore try and reduce the risk of further hemorrhages. That's the sort of thought process behind it. And um, the other stuff, mechanical thrombectomy is a very niche treatment for venous sinus thrombosis. Never, ever seen it used, so I wouldn't worry about it. Um, it's used for arterial strokes. Uh, neurosurgical referral is not the next best step. Um, they may consider it if there's something to evacuate, but in this scenario, we can't really see anything. It's not the next best step. Alteplase is not used for this. It's used for ischemic stroke. And prothrombin concentrate is used in someone who may have had a warfarin-induced hemorrhage or a direct oral anticoagulant-induced hemorrhage. So we wouldn't use that in this scenario. So that's why low molecular weight heparin is the correct answer. And just one of our last slides here, uh, venous sinus thrombosis um, is an occlusion of the venous channels. Thrombosis risk is there. It can be related to a nearby mass or infection. So uh, really interestingly, last week I saw a patient who had an ear infection, who had infection in the brainstem. They came in with diplopia and they had a venous sinus thrombosis secondary to a mass or infection, uh, sorry, the infection near the area, which I thought was very interesting. Um, Headache, uh, low GCS can be diplopia, visual loss, seizures. So actually, it can be quite a lot. So a lot of it is actually based on your index of suspicion. A lot of them will have some sort of thrombosis risk. CT head, you can see this hyperdense vein or this empty delta sign, which is a filling defect in the superior sagittal sinus. It can lead to this backlog via this and lead to a hemorrhage. And you treat with heparin, which is uh, interesting. And then, of course, after the acute episode settles and they're settled, you can give them something like um, a, a direct oral anticoagulant. It'll depend on which one, depending on, um, to be honest, that's beyond what I would normally understand. I think, I think some people use a doxaban, but I can't remember. Um, but certainly a, a direct oral anticoagulant is useful. Um, this is, sorry, this is our last question. Sorry, this is the last question. My bad. If, if people are happy to go through or have people sort of, yeah, I think people are. Uh, fine, let's just do this last question and then we'll wrap up. 
Um, cool. So I think just another maybe 10 more seconds or so, and then we'll, we'll have a look. Um, yeah, cool. So we're going for um, B, 45% have gone for motor neuron disease, and also E, uh, have gone for Creutzfeldt Jacob disease, okay, which is less likely. Uh, I think no one's gone for the correct answer, which is actually C, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so I think it makes sense because those people would have thought motor neuron disease, and I see why, because you've got someone who's few day history of left hand weakness and there's left arm finger flexion. Um, and then he's has new right foot weakness and absent ankle jerks. So I think with motor neuron disease, as we were saying earlier, the sort of the classical presentation is more with someone who has an upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron signs together. In this particular scenario, we have two different sort of, uh, two different signs that are relating to lower motor neuron disease. So what weak left arm flexion, abduction, weak left arm reflexes, sensory loss. You would not expect sensory loss in a motor neuron disease because it's motor neuron. So that makes it not the case because you can't have sensory loss in motor neuron disease because it only affects the motor neuron. Um, and there's also new right foot weakness and absent ankle jerks. So really you have two, what sounds very discreet episodes of nerve loss, uh, sorry, nerve dysfunction. And that is something we call mononeuritis multiplex, which essentially is when you have this two different or three different areas of nerve damage that are lower motor neuron and that happen together. And they can be idiopathic, but it can be related to an underlying diagnosis. So there are localization reasons, reasons why the other stuff is incorrect. So multiple sclerosis, lower motor neuron, it can't be multiple sclerosis because it only affects the central nervous system. It must be upper motor neuron. Motor neuron disease we discussed. Myasthenia gravis, there's sensory loss. There is mycena gravis does not affect the sensory sides of the body because it's only on the motor neuron. And finally, Crossfield Jacob disease uh, or Jacob, I don't know sure how to pronounce it, uh, CJD, it comes across as more of a uh, sorry, a generalized, maybe memory loss, seizures, that sort of stuff. It doesn't really relate to uh, sort of nerve damage in that sense as much, classically speaking. So it's less likely to be the answer. Um, so the mononeuritis multiplex, to be honest, the most common is actually diabetes. Um, but again, the, the reason that I put that question up is just because you really have to localize it and you can actually, you can exclude the other stuff just by thinking about it in a bit more detail. And basically this mononeuritis multiplex, you have this peripheral neuropathy, um, where you have different nerve trunks that are affected and they can be affected at different times. And it can be a vasculitis, but calls can be immune uh, mediated diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis. So by exclusion in the previous answer, rheumatoid is a possible diagnosis. We can get other infections, sarcoidosis, blah, 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 other stuff. But uh, just as a, as a phenomenon, I want you to, to know what I'm actually talking about there. So uh, thank you very much for coming. This is my summary of top three differentials. Um, so I'd like you to sort of use it in more detail. Um, and then hopefully that was a good session and you, I'll put it up on our YouTube channel and I really, really hope it was useful. It was very, very, very hard. Uh, so uh, I appreciate everyone for sticking around. So it's very, very useful, hopefully, um, to just have an understanding of neurology. Uh, and then for those who want to develop their interests further, hopefully it will lead to you reading some more. But a lot of these questions are beyond medical school level. And perhaps some of them you may come across in finals to a certain extent. But on the most part, um, a lot of it is just for general interest and for understanding the fundamental principles. Um, if you want to be a neurologist in the UK, uh, you train for three years, uh, you, then you do neurology training in five years, stroke and general medicine, and it's an academic specialty. Lots of people uh, will do a PhD, but it's not necessary for entrance to the specialty. Um, we will do a tutorial in a few weeks time, I think, on how to get into internal medicine training, uh, which we can do, and then hopefully that'll be useful. Um, I think,